Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends the question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host Michael Montalvo and for the next few minutes we will open history's door and find out what makes today truly unique. On this episode, we examine the events that occurred January 1st. Today is the start of the new year, and as such, a lot of us are going to be nursing hangovers and making resolutions we are going to give up on in a matter of months, maybe hours. Like one time, I made a resolution to become a social media influencer, and that was all the way back in December of 2019, so, you know, let's get on that. Anyway, I thought I would make this another theme month and talk about publications, which, if I know anything about contractions, is nothing more than public education. So, in order to commemorate this new year, let's talk about the story of a man who tries to play God having clearly never seen the cover to Hank Moody's God Hates Us All. Before we talk about the story, let's talk a bit about the writer. Mary Shelley was born August 30th, 1797 in London. She was the daughter of a political writer and a (gasps) gasp feminist. Her mother was a writer herself and had authored The Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792. After her mother died, her father was left to care for Shelley and her half-sister. Her father, William Godwin, would eventually go on to marry Mary Jane Claremont, much to the despair of of spider people and stoners the world over. Just like Cinderella, however, she did not get along with her stepmother, who saw no need to formally educate her. But that didn't stop her from spending time at her mother's graveside, where she would be found daydreaming and reading. She began a relationship with Percy Shelley in 1814, despite the fact that he was married, and soon the pair would travel to Europe where they ran around visiting cities and exploring the history that was there to be offered. They just ran. Ran all night and day. But they couldn't get away. They struggled financially and matters were made worse by the loss of their first child in 1815. It was in the following summer that the Shelleys, Jane Claremont, Lord Bryan, and John Polidori found themselves in Switzerland, bored with nothing on TV to watch. Presented with little else, they got together and read ghost stories to one another. They spent the evening reading the stories until Lord Brian got the idea that maybe they should write their own horror story. And rather than call the group a bunch of turds before running to her room to listen to the newest Lord single, Yah, 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 Mary Shelley instead began work on what would eventually become Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, open parentheses, and Bob, close parentheses. On the road to publication, however, things are not always easy. Over the next year, tragedy struck as she lost her half-sister, Franny, and Percy lost his wife, both, to suicide. In a somewhat macabre sentence, the death of Percy's wife allowed the two to be married in December of 1816, and in 1817 she published a travelogue of her European adventures with Percy, her sister, Clark, Ellen, Rusty, Audrey, and Cousin Eddie. History of the Six Weeks Tour, all while continuing work on what would be her most famous of works. The year was 1818, and on this day, January 1st, Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, was first published by an anonymous author by the London publishing house Lackington, Hughes, Harding, Maver, and Jones. Wait, anonymous? Yes. There was some confusion. Percy Shelley wrote the introduction, and so many assumed it was he who had written the story, much like how many believed Walter Keane was responsible for Margaret Keane's big eyes. The truth of it is that people believed that Mary Shelley was just not good enough to have written the novel. They knew whoever wrote it was close to Godwin, Shelley's father, but from there it was attributed to his son-in-law instead of his daughter. In fact, there's still a debate as to who the real author is. In the book, The Man Who Wrote Frankenstein, it is alleged that Mary Shelley was too weak and sentimental to write the story. 
and Professor Charles Robinson of the University of Delaware alleges that some 5,000 changes were made by Percy to Mary's work and states that the two should share credit. Now then, back to Mary and Percy Shelley. Their marriage wasn't great. Filled with affairs and heartache with the loss of four children, their only child to survive into adulthood, Percy Florence, was born in 1819. Then, as if one tragedy after the other was not enough, her husband drowned in 1822, and she became a widow at only 24. She worked hard to support herself and her son, writing and publishing more of her work, as well as her husband's poetry, to preserve his place in the world of literature. Mary Shelley would eventually die February 1st, 1851 at 53 from brain cancer, and in an act that's totally goth, she was buried with the remains of her husband's cremated heart. Now, I'm sure everyone knows the story of old Dr. Victor Frankenstein and his monster, Frankenstein's monster. Some of you may even be familiar with Frankenstein's monster's monster, Frankenstein, or even still, the story of Dr. Frederick Frankenstein. But just in case, let's give a brief synopsis. The story begins during an Arctic expedition. While his ship is stuck, Captain Walton and his crew see an eight-foot man driving a dog sled. The crew stand and watch him until he disappears into the great alone of the distance. Moments later, a regular-sized man appears on a sled with his snow buddies, showing an iron will to make it in the eight-below weather, and although he is almost dead, he keeps fighting Togo on. They take the man aboard their ship, and he is revealed to be that of Victor Frankenstein, and not... Little Willie, who is out to win $500 to pay the back taxes on his grandfather's farm. Frankenstein and the captain soon become friends, which prompts Victor to tell his story. An important family in Geneva, the Frankensteins, were well off, and look, it was a different time, but he and his cousin Elizabeth were close, and they were expected to marry. I'm not making excuses, I'm just telling it like it is. He went to university and began his scientific journey where he became something of a prodigy, just not one of the electronica variety. It is here that he learns the secret to reanimation, and in an act that again shows himself not a fan of the work of Hank Moody, decides to dedicate his work to it. What is it? We don't know, he never says. Now here's where it begins to differ from what you may be familiar with. In a truly... Tragic turn of events, Marty Feldman does not make an appearance, and Dr. Frankenstein gathers body parts alone in order to bring the monster to life. On a dark and stormy night, he succeeds, and is so terrified by what he was able to accomplish that he flees. He tries to sleep, but finds the monster watching over him, and again flees for safety into the streets where he finds his childhood friend, Henry. When they return to the apartment, the monster is gone, and Victor is sick. He decides to return to Geneva and receives word that his youngest brother, William, has been murdered. He rushes home to find that Justine Moritz, a girl adopted by his household, is accused, tried, and convicted of his brother's murder. With the deaths of two of his loved ones, Victor Frankenstein begins to fear that his monster likes to paint houses. He tries to get away from it all and goes to the mountains, but even in this remote location, the monster finds him. There he tells his story of learning to speak and read and write, and it is here the creature admits to William's murder and the framing of Justine. But he's like, really sorry about it because he totally didn't mean to kill him. He meant to kill Victor instead, so the way he sees it, they're pretty much even. The monster begs Victor to create a mate for him, but the doctor says no, at first. But the monster is very persuasive because he says he will kill a lot of people and this convinces Victor to change his mind. Victor returns to Geneva, then he and Henry return to London and make their way to Scotland where he is quickly abandoned so Victor can go to an island in the Orkneys to begin work on the new creature. But conscience gets the better of him, and realizing there will be no vaudevillian act in his future destroys the new creature after the monster gives him a frightening grin through the window. Now the monster vows revenge, saying, I'll be with you on your wedding night. The creature's body is disposed of, and Victor wakes up in a strange place, and perhaps fearing that he is in the wrong book, as he is informed that his friend Henry has been killed, and he is the suspect. Victor Frankenstein 
can hide no more. That joke works a lot better on paper. Then, he gets sick again, and is eventually acquitted. Hooray! Question mark? Question mark indeed. He returns to Geneva, marries Elizabeth, and fearing the monster's attack, promptly sends her away where she is murdered. It turns out, I'll be with you on your wedding night means I'm going to kill your new bride in Monster. He also apparently left Geneva because he returns again just in time for his father to die of grief. He vows to spend the rest of his life tracking down the monster so that he can exact his revenge because this time it's personal. The chase leads them north beyond the wall onto the ice and powered by dog sled. And that's when Walton stumbled upon them. Victor, who is sick, again, worsens and dies. When Walton goes to check on the body, he is shocked to discover that they are not in Geneva and that the monster is weeping over the dead body of its creator. The monster has lived a life of solitude and fear which led to anger, which led to hate, which led to suffering. But he is also remorseful. The creature tells Walton that now Frankenstein is dead, he too can die, and departs to go to the northernmost ice to end his life. The End A true classic of literature, it's a story that has been turned into films countless times, first by Thomas Edison in 1910 and then twice in Germany. The Golem, 1914, in which Frankenstein is haunted by a ring of power, and in Homunculus, 1916, where the monster is named Roger for some reason. Perhaps the most famous retelling of the story is that starring Boris Karloff as the monster in 1931. It is this version of Frankenstein that has most prominently entered pop culture and shaped much of how we view the monster today. Other notable films include Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein, Kenneth Branagh's Frankenstein starring Robert De Niro, and I, Frankenstein, which perhaps features the most good-looking of all the Frankensteins, Aaron Eckhart. Then, of course, there is Van Helsing, which has no vans, very little to do with hell, and unless I am misremembering, no singing. So just keep that in mind if you plan on watching it. And that's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps me steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the audio version on your podcast app of choice. Links in the description. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And to thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Pew, <laughs>